There we go. All right. My name is Seth. If you found this video, you uh, either follow me personally or uh, one of these fine gentlemen or my company, Manx Solutions. Getting into a little bit more on the numbers, uh, we did a couple of blog posts right after the Missouri primary showing social media numbers, if you go deep enough into the analytics, are more predictive than the polls. We got some more information uh, on that. I'm going to go ahead and dive in. So James from Gray Rock Digital, what are you seeing here now? We've, we've got kind of a fresh batch of numbers. You literally emailed us like two in the morning. So um, man, way to put that, that work in on a Sunday morning. What, what's going on? What are you seeing? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's fascinating because I looked at the polling for the uh, Missouri governor's race where we had sort of a surprise ending uh, with um, Kehoe winning over the front runner Ashcroft and Eigel actually finishing in second place. And so, uh, you know, the uh, the Remington group poll uh, had it tied um, about a week or two weeks out um, in July at 29, 29, 18. And uh, so that's a, a thousand likely voters. They actually did some pretty excellent polling on some of the other down ballot races that they nailed, like Vivek winning Treasurer uh, and a couple others. So this isn't about being critical necessarily of individual polls. But um, you have uh, from the Tyson group, a uh, 500 likely voter poll that had it at 29 for Ashcroft, 18 for Kehoe. And then thirteen for um, Ashcroft, or and then uh, yeah, thirteen for uh, Igor. So, uh, considering that what we actually had was um, uh, Kehoe winning with thirty nine percent of the vote over Igor's thirty two percent, and Ashcroft finishing third uh, at at twenty three, that last poll actually had it completely wrong. I mean, it completely reversed the order. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just inaccurate, right? And uh, the first poll from Remington, it didn't call, um, uh, you know, it it maybe got, uh, well, it, you know, it, it, it had Ashcroft six points ahead of where he ended up, um, you know, and it just, you generally don't see that much movement in the last, you know, week or two of a race like this. Um, and, and we'll get to strategy in a minute. But so uh, if you look at their MEC reports for finance, of course, you have Kehoe finishing with four million dollars. And I believe he, he actually saved a million for the general. So he only spent three, I think, three million over um, Ashcroft's uh, one point two six four million. So, uh, you know, he got outspent three to one. Really got out fundraised, you know, four to one. And uh, but interestingly, Eigel uh, raised almost as much as Ashcroft with one point five million total. Uh, and in the final eight day report, Eigel actually raised more money than both Ashcroft and Kehoe, which is fascinating. And that's what we saw in the social analytics. Um, and if you go to at, uh, at greatrock.digital. Um, and go into, uh, I'll have a link there to this post, which will be um, you know, a, a pretty deep analysis of the governor's race where um, Ashcroft 60 days out has about 17,000 total mentions, or, or I should say over 60 days. Um, Kehoe in the same time period has 29,000 mentions, right? And Eigel, like really sort of unbelievable, triples that with 94,000 mentions over the last 60 days of the uh, election. And if you look at the trends um, on content, while uh, Kehoe gets some good hits at the end, uh, Igle really had the massive hit at the end where he launched his 30-second TV spot. And uh, it, I mean, you could say it went viral. I know we don't like to say that, but it pretty much did. I mean, it's a massive mountain of, just content talking about uh, the creative in that ad uh, and the fact that a governor you know, of a state is going to deport, you know, every illegal immigrant that's here and puts the ad up with the, uh, you know, with, with the, uh, the translator, um, uh, which was, you know, as serious as it was sort of humorous, you know, on a serious topic. 
Um, and that's the biggest digital event of all three campaigns that happened. Um, it's interesting, right around uh, New Year's, Ashcroft had probably his biggest day of digital where he had a similar um, uh, spike, you know, really like six months before the election. And uh, and like like that's not great, right? Um, and Eigel timed his spike sort of perfectly, but you do have Keo winning, even though Eigel uh, trended way ahead in mentions, you definitely have Kehoe still generating enough mentions, um, you know, with, with 30,000. It, it should have been more than that, but 30,000 in the last 60 days is pretty good. And that grew 429% over the 5.5 thousand mentions he had in the, you know, looking out three and four months back out. And we're looking at this from reverse. So, um, you know, quite frankly, the social analytics, when we talked about, you know, Eigel potentially being able to win, if there's another two, maybe three weeks added to this election cycle, Eigel could have potentially overtaken Kehoe. Now, Kehoe had, uh, if you go back and look at the at the finances, Kehoe had kind of a secret weapon now because he had the four million that he had raised over the course of um, 2024. And he still had most of that in the bank, but he also had what he didn't see was um, about five hundred thousand dollars in the uh, firefighters and cops for Kehoe packs that were associated with his campaign. And it was particularly it was the police uh, did uh, they spent about four hundred and eleven thousand dollars in that last eight day period on radio ads, direct mail, uh, and you know just supporting that final effort, that final push. So what you can see, I think, is Kehoe really really executing on his plan. And even if you think of in that last that last push where um uh, where Eigel had the momentum and, and he raised $191,000 in that last push and and he raised more money than Kehoe did, Kehoe had already shut off his fundraising by that point. Like he was done raising the money he needed to raise. Um, and it looked like, again, he held back about $1.2 million, so confident that he was going to advance into the general election. So uh, quite a story that, you know, I, I haven't heard either one of these points mentioned in media about the race, um, you know, other than, you know, the prolific fundraising. But it was very strategic in how it was done. You know, it was well integrated into the campaign strategy. Uh, and it could be counted on to sort of uh, support the social outreach that they did do, which maybe wasn't quite as much as the other campaigns, but was still considerable. Um, and, you know, and, and sad to say, because I'm, I'm a big fan of Jay Ashcroft, you know, he was behind in fundraising, you know, almost the entire time. He was behind in uh, mentions and social media, uh, really behind both, uh, both campaigns, both Eigel and Keto like the entire time. So uh, you have a, a you know kind of a failure to execute a strategy and a plan there. And Kehoe just executed, I think, magnificently, while Eigel very effectively sort of flew by the seat of his pants um, to be able to get, you know, fairly close uh, within, you know, six or seven points in the, um, in the Missouri governor's primary. So candidates that are still in this thing, and people who are working with those candidates, what do you pull from here? Because what I just heard you say is that there is kind of a sports element here it, that it's not just that you peak, it's when you peak. So there are 80 some days until, uh, till the November election. What do we just learn from this, this governor's race that can help candidates win right now? So I, I think one of the biggest things is uh, building capacity. And, you know, we have, we have Peter Pfeiffer on with us to, uh, um, you know, to discuss this too, where, that building capacity is key, and Eigel did it from the very beginning and mentioned at each time that the media was reporting he was behind, he would say, yeah, but, you know, I'm not behind as far as I was a week ago or a month ago, and we're steadily building, and we have a plan to do that. And then he was executing his plan, and that capacity build was really important. So when he actually had his sort of, you know, again, I hate to say it, but viral moment when he launched the, uh, the campaign ad. 
he actually had a digital infrastructure in place that would support that, that would be able to capture um, as much of that support as possible. Whereas, you know, a lot of times a huge bump like that just sort of gets left out in the wind. You know, you, you certainly get, you know, a, a ton of positive from it. But if you don't have capacity built, it's really hard to capture the data and be able to, whether it's reach out to all those folks, um, you know, have the mechanisms in place to uh, to capture, you know, the benefits of that viral moment. And Eigel did. And so it's putting all of those pieces together, like at the same time. Uh, Peter Pfeiffer joins us. You got a crazy number of votes um, by pulling on a pretty strong digital first uh, campaign there in the last six weeks. Like, what did you see in this? Like, as far as actual real life reactions to people out there, what did you see uh, once you got a lot more video ahead of you on your strategy? Well, as a candidate, I felt like I could I could be everywhere at one time. And that that is the capacity I think that James is mentioning. Uh, if I'm out talking at an event and directing people to my website and directing them to my uh, my social media as well, to be able to, to to capture not only their information but to to foster the message as well, and they can they can spend a little more time on my social media. I don't cover every topic at every stop, and to have the the capacity to deliver the message. Uh, more broadly uh, to either a specific individual or, or a group at large was was very important. And I think that that drive towards the end where I got the, uh, the video component up and running, um, again, I was able to spend, you know, 20 or 30 minutes per week and deliver a week's worth of content in that 20 to 30 minutes was huge when only a limited amount of time remained in the campaign. So this is really a great time to, to invest in the delivery of a message and, and make sure that you don't deliver the amount of time it is necessary to get that message out there. That's the magic of the social and the magic that we're talking about right here is to be able to spend 20 or 30 minutes a week and have the message delivered repeatedly, uh, um, often and consistently across the socials. That's a very important thing that helps carry, um, you know, maybe 20, 25% of the vote total that I got towards the end of this campaign. And uh, I mean, this is going to sound a little self-serving because full disclosure, I did Peter's videos, but I get the question a lot of people that are either running a political campaign, they're running a business, um, you know, they're, they're out writing books and speaking all the time. Like where in the world am I going to fit in a podcast or, you know, a video like this? On the one hand, I feel like I'm getting killed not having it because my competition who have more money have it. But on the other hand, I can't afford it and I don't have time for it. Uh, the, the, sweet spot that we live in is that if you can just sit down and talk for 30 to 60 minutes a week, the rest can get filled in. And the bottom line is if you are not posting, um, you know, vertical reels, vertical videos, uh, every, you know, like at least three a day, you don't really exist as far as the algorithms go. And you may have people that are like, Oh, I, I see your stuff. The one of the brutal things about social media in 2024 People are not liking and following pages anymore because the algorithm is giving them so much of what they like. And so if you're not hitting frequency, then you're not getting to the core customer base that you really need to get to. They, they are not going to your page. They're not hitting like. They're just expecting that the algorithm will give them the next good thing. If you're posting a short video a couple times a week, you're never going to be in the algorithm enough to matter. It's just not going to work. And so you're going to have to get used to posting a bunch. It doesn't have to be expensive. And it really is not time consuming on your side as long as you got the right system. And we've got that put together for you. Yeah, and honestly, had, you know, Eigel or Ashcroft followed that advice, and Eigel did a better job, I think, than Ashcroft did. Uh, you could be looking at an entirely different race. But, you know, it's not something you can just do in the last week, which is sort of a tradition uh, when a lot of people talk about, um, about political campaigning. It's like, oh, well, people aren't paying attention until the last two weeks or the last week. It's like you need to be up, you know, six months before, if you can, doing that audience development work and, and converting that audience, growing your audience and then converting it to individuals that you know and grabbing their contact information through different conversion pieces, whether it's folks signing up for a yard sign 
to give a contribution or just opt in or email, even just to follow you, you know, on X. All those things are critical hand raises that the campaign has to be in a position to capture. So again, you have that need for that capacity to be able to leverage, you know, what you're generating. But you really do need, most importantly, uh, I think what, you know, from what both of you just said, you really do need that capacity in terms of the frequency of the posts. And it really does need to be video too. I mean, we could throw in photo and text copy is great for, uh, for diversity, but that video element is so critical every single day, especially of, it, of something as intense as a political campaign. Absolutely. Hey, we would love to help. There's still plenty of time here. Uh, the fate of any of these races at 80 days out, 80 some days out is not decided. It is not just who you are as a candidate. It is what you're going to say and how many people see it before November 5th. It's going to make the difference. That's right. And, yeah, and I just want to say one last thing for, for those candidates who are still like, well, where do I fit in the time? I bet you spend easily 30 minutes, if not an hour or two, talking to people during the course of your day, your campaign manager, your consultant, your spouse, about strategy, about what's happening on the campaign. And that's literally all you need to do is record those conversations. And so that's the service that we're offering at the core of this. Um, and it's going to change your life if you're a candidate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're getting, if you're getting radio interviews too, uh, put your phone on a tripod. Then we've got some video and audio to, to merge up. It's seriously that simple. Put your phone on a tripod. Um, it doesn't have to be the best video in the whole dang world. Um, we just need to get something to create a lot of little short moments for you um, to when people walk in on November 5th, they've seen you a lot. One of the most sinister but correct quotes in business comes from the CEO of uh, Mercedes who said, the, our first time customer is 31 years old, but if I want them to buy a Mercedes at 31, I can't show them the logo at 27 and get them to buy four years later. They've got to see that in kindergarten and know that, that, that we're an iconic brand. Uh, first of all, that's evil. Please stop selling luxury goods to kindergartners. But second of all, the, the principle is very correct. Um, it's not going to happen the last couple of weeks. You need to get a lot of brand familiarity right now. If you want to do that, we can help. Uh, you can uh, find a little bit more info on, get, on getting a hold of us in the uh, description of this video. Okay. You want to cut it there? Okay. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, I'll turn this into a blog post, uh, and I can turn this into